in communities around the Chesapeake Bay, neighborhoods are flooding more often. Storms are becoming more intense with more rain falling. Sea level rise is hitting Chesapeake Bay shorelines, giving the region some of the fastest rising waters in the country. In short, we are already seeing the effects of climate change. In rural areas, farmers are weathering more intense periods of alternating drought and heavy rains. It's the swing that we're really worried about because one year we have to deal with little to no rain and the next year we have to deal with as much as 80 inches of rain. In cities, unshaded buildings and streets absorb more heat. High temperatures in some communities are literally making people sicker. What we find is in the areas that have fewer trees and have fewer green spaces, those places are much hotter than areas with more green space, with more trees. That's only going to get worse with climate change. Climate change is here today, and it's already affecting us now. And if we don't do something now, it's only going to be worse. The habitats that support Chesapeake wildlife are also feeling the impacts of climate change. Rising waters have caused the loss of over 150,000 acres of forests surrounding the Chesapeake. Temperatures and intense weather also cause problems in the thousands of freshwater streams feeding into the bay. It's blowing what folks thought a hundred year flood was out the window. So as you're starting to see these flows come through, um, they're more flashy. So it's impacting these fish. It's not a stable environment for them to live in. In response to climate change, fish and other wildlife are shifting their ranges northward. Estuaries have a lot of ability to absorb change, but if we push too hard, they may become something else. We will also retain a lot of the character of the Chesapeake, and what we'll end up with is some combination, a novel ecosystem, if you will. In the Chesapeake Bay, underwater grasses are a critical habitat that is recovering from historic declines. And those grasses are really important because they put oxygen in the water and they're also important habitat for crabs and fish and they're food for waterfowl. But seagrass in the lower Chesapeake is struggling from newer threats. The emerging threats is climate change from temperature and these pulse events with excessive runoff for long periods of time. Temperature and ocean acidification are impacting the Chesapeake's iconic blue crabs and oysters in different ways. You throw a dirty penny into a, a bottle of soda and it comes out clean. Well, it comes out clean because of the acidity that the dissolved carbon dioxide induces. And at a less extreme sense, that's exactly what's happening with ocean acidification. Many organisms deposit a mineral called calcium carbonate in shells. The deposition of that calcium carbonate depends critically on the pH. The concerns are that shells may become thinner or animals may grow less fast. We probably don't think enough about the diversity of animals and plants that are affected by it. Temperature is going to be the primary environmental factor that's going to be affecting crabs in the future. The crab population will most likely be much more active through a longer portion of the year. If we think about crabs growing more needing to eat more food, and they may be targeting these species that are a bit more vulnerable to climate change, that could have implications for the whole Chesapeake Bay food web. People across the Chesapeake watershed are already working to adapt to climate change and mitigate its worst effects. Trees are good for pretty much everything. <laughs> they, of course, absorb carbon. They reduce stormwater impacts from uh, major rainstorms. That can go on forever. As you can see, there are large trees here behind me that we put in by hand, which I'm really proud to see. Fish, fish. Try it again. Beautiful cast. It is definitely a generational interest throughout my family. Pull, pull. Brook trout need cold, clean water to thrive. 
Some of the things that impact brook trout are sediment and warming water temperatures, which have been a result of removing a lot of the riparian canopy. So our thought is to improve the habitat, improve the infrastructure around these streams so that we can deal with some of these issues as, as we do see these more extreme weather events. On farms, regenerative agricultural practices are increasing the resilience of fields to both drought and storms. Those practices include no-till, which keeps soil in place, and cover crops, which protect bare soil year-round. They're really the two founding principles for soil health. It also helps with the resiliency of the field. Soil organic matter, it's that huge sponge. Healthy soils um, infiltrate water so much better when we do get those rainfalls. I see soil health as playing a huge role in mitigating the effects of our climate swings and those fluctuations that we're already seeing. Healthy soils have the added benefit of pulling more carbon from the air and sequestering it underground. In a similar fashion, the Chesapeake Bay's 500,000 acres of tidal wetlands sequester even more carbon than forested land. Wetlands also help absorb storms. Because wetlands are essentially the purification system for the Chesapeake Bay and for the tributaries, when we lose an acre of wetland, we're losing that ability to filter rainwater, to filter groundwater, to have this habitat for species that desperately need it. Restored wetlands and living shorelines are making communities, and even military facilities, more resilient. We are trying to protect our infrastructure by investing in shoreline restoration projects. We obviously get an increase in biodiversity in those areas and we get flood resilience. We get protection from the energy inputs of wind and water when we have major storm events like we have over the last few years. Cities are learning that while large-scale construction of dams and levees may have protected residents from flooding in the past, the future lies with many smaller projects working together. We're looking in the upper parts of the watershed, we're looking to put wetlands in, reconnect floodplains. It's a more dynamic watershed approach rather than just focusing on the river itself. Where can we spend those limited resources that we have? It's changing the culture of how we manage our streams in a holistic way. After centuries of declines, the health of the Chesapeake Bay is improving. This is because we are reducing the amount of sediment and nutrient pollution flowing downstream. But the question remains, how will climate change affect the Chesapeake's recovery? Dead zones, areas of low oxygen in the bay, appear every summer after excess nutrients feed algae blooms. The lack of oxygen in the water kills fish and other wildlife that can't escape. We want to bring the oxygen back because that's what's important for crabs and oysters and, and fish like rockfish. And then when we get more water clarity in the bay, that's when we bring back the underwater grasses. If you reduce sediments and nutrients, as long as plants have light, they can deal with increasing temperature. If we did nothing to reduce nutrient pollution, the annual dead zone would get worse as the region gets warmer and wetter. But by continuing restoration efforts, by doing things like planting trees, restoring wetlands, and making communities more resilient, we can cut off the fuel that feeds dead zones. And so, many of the actions already needed to restore the Chesapeake Bay are even more important in the effort to limit climate change.